Welcome to the Life Plus God podcast. I am your host, Alyssa Robinson, and today my special guest is our one and only senior pastor, Reverend Daniel Humbert. Hey, hey, how are you? I'm so excited to have you on this episode because this is a little bit of a special episode. Mm. So for people who are listening who maybe you're not connected to Treach Memorial United Methodist Church in any way, you don't know what's going on at this church that we're podcasting out of, we are are covering the book of Revelation wow. in November. And I will tell you, when I first heard that, I got a little nervous because <laughs> you and me both. I work at a church and I have never once cracked open the book of Revelation. All right. Ever. Um it scares me. It's I, intimidating. I don't understand. Why would you not want to read this book? Well, let me tell you, I tried to read it. Okay. <laughs> so being a good podcast host, I thought, well, maybe I should read the book that we're going to be talking about. I read through about half of it and I got so frustrated <laughs> that I gave up and I just went to Google and said, Revelation Cliff Notes. Like I can't, okay. I couldn't get through it all the way because I had no idea what was going on. And so that's what I'm really hoping out it's of this podcast read. episode. Yes, it's really difficult to read and it feels very culturally specific <laughs> <laughs> or I, I don't, so I can't decide what this book is. Is it a fever dream? Is it a code <laughs> language? Is it like, what is going on? Well, John was caught up in the spirit, so it's going to be different. Yeah. And so, um, you know, before actually opening the book, my only understanding of Revelation was basically Bible thumping people talking about the rapture and yeah. you better get ready. Jesus is coming back. Is your, are you living your life right? right. You know, uh, they're coming for you sort of thing. And then in the 90s, early so have 2000s. No. So and, and there was a huge fear around that for my generation, right? Yep. Because right. I was growing up in the 90s, early 2000s, where the Left Behind series. Yeah was yeah. so popular and Kurt Cameron was, mm -hmm. you know, leading the parade on that. And we loved him from growing pains and <laughs> all of these <laughs> things. And so my understanding of revelation is just so minimal. And so I'm hoping that you'll put your seminary hat on for us a little bit today. Cause we'll I bet you've studied it a little <laughs> bit more than the average Joe. Maybe. Maybe. So I just want to jump into my first question. Well, let me just real quick before you do that. So as you pointed out, so in the 90s, you know, there was this sort of thrush around it. And but the reality is in the 70s, there was too. And in the 50s, there was too. We're really probably primed to see something along those lines again real soon, because roughly every 20 to 30 years, there is sort of this resurgence about an interest in it and what it means and how we're going to interpret it. So um, your, your generation was just like my generation. I was a, a teenager when uh, some of this stuff came out as well. So, so the, the current teenagers will have their own story they about will. how Revelation impacted them in a, an odd way. And I will say that's one of the fun things about being the digital strategist at this church is I get to see the search terms that mm -hmm. come to our website. And I'll tell you this, once every four years around the pre presidential election, <laughs> it started, is Barack Obama the Antichrist four years later? Is Donald Trump the Antichrist four years later? Is Joe Biden the Antichrist? Antichrist. Yeah. Those are all search terms that are coming to our website. And a lot of them are asking about Revelation, asking about the end times. Um, and so, yeah, and in, there's in a part. That's why we're doing this, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Let's let's bust some myths here. There you go. So what is the history and context behind the book of Revelation? When was it written? Who wrote it? Who was it written for? Why was it written? Yeah. Like, why is this? Why are we doing this? Yeah. Well, so to start with, it literally is the last book, not only in the Bible, but the last book written. Uh, it is the latest of all books included in what's known as the canon, right? The thing that we call the Bible, we refer to as a canon. And uh, the, the book was probably written sometime, most scholars believe, sometime between 90 and 95 AD. Uh, some scholars think it was written earlier, uh, as early as 65. But most scholars say somewhere around 90, 95. It was written by a guy named John. It says so in the book. Uh, some scholars early on in the uh, history of the church thought that was the gospel writer of John. But most scholars now believe it's a guy called John the Elder. Uh, he likely wrote the three letters of John and the book of Revelation, but probably not the gospel writer, John. 
Uh, he was isolated on the island of Patmos. He was a, likely a prisoner for his faith. And so in part, what John is doing is writing this book to say, hey, guys, I know life can be really tough, and I know you might be persecuted for your faith, but I want you to persevere. He'll use some different language here about conquering or overcoming, but it's basically, hey, can you hang out? Can you persevere through the struggles of what the, the Roman Empire is doing to us? Because he's writing it, uh, again, if it's 90 to 95, during the reign of a guy named Domitian, who was a major ruler and a descendant of Caesar Augustus. And um, he was literally killing Christians left and right for their faith. He was calling himself Lord and God, and that if you weren't professing your faith in him as the leader, you were an atheist, right? Which is weird language to us, right? Because we think you're an atheist if you don't have a faith of any kind. He was simply saying to mission was, if you don't call me Lord, if you don't call me God, then you are an atheist. And guess what? We kill atheists. And so Christians were considered atheists because they weren't calling Domitian Lord. And so that's, that's the primary reason John's writing the book. So this guy, John, wrote it. He's a prisoner at the time. And I did catch on as I was reading it. He said he had this vision, had this dream. He's caught up in the spirit, it tells us, right in the very beginning. Yeah. What does that mean? Because <laughs> I'm I'm wondering, like, why did the people who were reading this at the time understand the things he was saying? Was he speaking in a way that they're like, because when you say that Christians are persecuted and they're being killed, I'm guessing they're not just going to be openly sharing stories That's about correct. this guy, John, is telling us to persevere in our faith and all of these things. They've got to talk in a code language because they're underground at that, this point. That's correct. So is is it a code language? Is it a dream? Is it a vision? Is it reflections of literal things that are happening at that time? The answer is yeah, <laughs> to every last one of those, right? So it's a vision in that John believes he's, he's, he's being called to express these thoughts. It's a, uh, he's caught up in the spirit, which is, you know, literally, I mean, uh, you know, we United Methodists don't see this a lot, right? But ca being caught up in the spirit is kind of a frenzy-like, kind of a, uh, I'm not acting normally, or I may be getting visions or si sightings from God, if you will. Uh, and so our Pentecostal and charismatic brothers and sisters, this is normal for them. It's it's not necessarily normal for us, but it's something that can happen. That is to say, I, I'm just sort of overwhelmed with what I believe God is telling me, sharing with me, right? So John is, he's not, he, he may not literally be a prisoner, but Patmos was an island for prisoners, and uh, he's writing from Patmos. And um, he is writing in code. This is what's known as an apocalyptic. It's a, re the, the book is, the, the, the name Revelation literally means that. It is the revelation of John, or it's the revelation from John. And a, a revelation is an apocalyptic literature. Well, apocalyptic literature by its nature is filled with imagery that doesn't make sense, filled with um, symbols that don't always uh, ring true, uh, you know, on the surface. Because if I tell you the code, you might kill me because I'm part of the code is Domitian is evil. Part of the code is the Roman Empire is evil. Part of the code is um, we, we should not be following these folks and this evil that is ruling over us is going to come to an end at some point and we need to stick together and hang out until this is done. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't want any of them to know because he'll be killed and so will anybody else. Mm. So, so what do you have to say? Because that all makes sense to me. What doesn't make sense to me is people taking this code that was written for a specific people in a specific point of time in Rome and saying, this code still applies today and taking the signs and wonders that are pointed out in Revelation and say, uh, climate change is this or that um, this political figure is actually who they're talking about and treating it as a, a prophecy yep. as opposed to maybe a historical document of what was happening at the time. Yeah. Well, so uh, part of what I will say is it is still true today. That is to say it's applicable throughout all generations. A part of what John is saying is there's always going to be evil in the world. There's always going to be problems that we don't understand in the world. Now, he doesn't literally use that language because he is talking about specific stuff. But a part of what makes this book still relevant is we do still f face some forms of oppression. We do still face some forms of um, uh, circumstances where we're not 
um, able to express our true selves, right? And so he's, he's just saying, uh, utilize this. Now, for generations, but particularly in the, in the 19th and 20th and now 21st century, we have tried to apply it to current events. Prior to that, that was not as common. It would happen every once in a while, like when there was great turmoil in the schism of the church or when there was uh, uh, the Protestant Reformation, right? So about every 500 years, there might be some, oh, well, this must be the end times. Or, most of that is really over the last 100 to 150 years. But you see it over and over again. You saw it um, uh, at the turn of the 20th century. People were saying we're in end times. You saw it during World War II, right? We're in end times. You saw it, um, <clears throat> excuse me, with Saddam Hussein in the 1990s. We're in end times, right? So people are doing that over and over again because it seems easy to apply. Now, at the very beginning, John does say this is a prophecy, and so it, it, it seems a little um, almost conflictive because we know it to be a revelation that is to say apocalyptic literature, which has a whole genre of why it does what it does and how it does what it does. But a prophecy is a little different. And so I do see where or why people might try to do that. But the difficulty there is Jesus himself says to us in the Gospels, nobody knows when this end time is, you know, he doesn't use the word end time, but nobody knows when the Father's coming or nobody knows when this is happening but the Father. So to me, when, when the guy says, hey, don't get wrapped up in that. Don't get wrapped up in when the end time is, but rather do what you're supposed to do now, right? Love people, forgive people, be merciful and gracious and kind. Um, that's why I, I don't write off the book of Revelation because it really is quite applicable, but I don't ever try to use it as a, a way to predict the end of the world. That was not John's purpose at all. That was mm -hmm. not why he wrote the book. Yeah, because the, the way that I see it used most often today is as a tool to say, hey, you better get on board. Right. You only have a limited amount of time or else you're going to burn in hell for eternity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And in part, John is actually saying that to this degree. John is trying to say, look, during these difficult times when we are being oppressed, we do need to hang out together. We do need to hang in there together. And we do need to make sure that we are living the gospel as best we can. So to a degree, he is saying that, but it's not quite what you how you put it. So you, you've talked a little bit about, you know, there are different apocalyptic writings. And one of the things that I read is that there were actually um, some apocalyptic scriptures included in the Apocrypha that didn't make it into uh, our common day Bible. And I was just wondering if you have learned anything as to why, why is revelation the chosen <laughs> apocalyptic writing to be included in the Christian Bible? Yeah. Well, so a couple of things. One is in the Bible, we have the canon we have, there are some apocalyptic writings, right? The book of Daniel is an apocalyptic writing. The major portions of the book of Ezekiel are apocalyptic writings. Um, uh, the f three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have a chapter that is apocalyptic in, in its nature. So it isn't a atypical, right? The Apocrypha is not a part of the Protestant canon. It's a part of the Catholic canon. So that's in part why we don't uh, use it as, a, as an authoritative text. But um, I, I can only conjecture on why Revelation makes it versus another uh, apocalyptic literature. But my hunch is, and that's all it is, is that uh, early on again, it was believed that John, the gospel writer, was this author. And so if, if that's true, golly, if there's a writing from John, by golly, we want to include it. But the other point is it is so impactful in the early uh, stages of the church because it was written in real time for the church, right? It's, so it's the last thing written. It's written after all of Paul's letters. It's written after all of the gospels. It's written in real time for people. And so as the church puts it together, they think, man, this must be tremendously helpful for us because um, persecution is going to go on for another 200 years after this. It's only after uh, what we call Christendom starts in the third or fourth century where Christianity becomes the, the, the state religion, right, that that's not so much an issue. But for another 200 years, it's a really serious issue. And, and we believe, or the church believed, man, we could learn something from this guy. He's got some good information for us. So for the people at the time who this truly was, you know, the the book of the day, let's mm. say it was the New York times bestseller yeah, of the yeah, first century. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of the things? Cause we, we do, 
I do want to talk about the signs and wonders a little bit because seven is like the first five or six chapters, every (laughs) subheading is the seven, this, the seven, that the seven, what are some of the significant patterns that we can glean from revelation and how would it have caught the ear of the people hearing these stories who were going through it and around when revelation was written? So are you asking about like the numerology, for instance? Yeah. 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 Because there is a lot of numerology in the book of Revelation. I mean, uh, part of the reality is there's a lot of numerology in all the Bible. Most people don't, you know, you think about things like 40 days or years in the wilderness, right? Or Jesus in the, in, in the wilderness, 40. 40 days in the Bible just means a long time. It, it wasn't intended to be 40 literal days. It just means a long time. So in the Bible, numbers have great value. Three, for instance, is a holy number. It's a full number. It's the number of the Trinity, right? Six is a number of of evil. It's incomplete. It's human. Uh, It's not full. Four is like earthly things, like the four corners of the globe or the four winds of the earth, right? And then seven becomes a fascinating number because seven is a, a, a number for completeness or wholeness. And it's interesting because uh, part of the numerology is it's a combination of three and four. So a combination of sort of heaven and the Trinity and of humanity or the or the, not humanity, the earth. So seven is this very full number. That's why you're getting all these references, right? The seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, the, I can't even remember all of them, but there's a bunch of sevens, right? And then uh, 12 is a big number and was both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the 12 tribes of Israel for the old and the 12 disciples for the New Testament. Um, and then of course you get, uh, the very famous number six, 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 which mm-hmm. is attributed to evil, right? And that's a fascinating number because what it means is it's three sixes. So it's complete evil, 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 uh, three times. Uh, most people believe that's referencing either Nero who, who preceded Domitian or it's Domitian himself. Also, it's not referring to like an antichrist or a Satan or a devil. It's, that's it's, what I always thought. It's referencing the devil or the evil of the day who is Domitian. And so uh, to, to bring it forward, we could say, golly, if we believed somebody was, was really the most evil person in the world or really the most evil representation of evil, evil, you'd say 666. That's what you would say. And so that was like a code language for them of like when they said 666, all of the faithful readers uh, understood who they were talking about, but maybe someone who isn't a part of the Christian faith wouldn't know what it means at all. That's correct. That's correct. And it, it has such weight, as you point out, that people today think 666 is the mark of the beast, right? It's kind of the common deal. Yeah. Well, Domitian was considered the beast he, because beast is another symbol in his language that represents the evil empire or the evil emperor, right? Mm. Yeah. There's a lot of that language in there. So what are some of the other big symbols and signs that we need to know better to understand scripture outside of the numerology? Yeah. So there's a couple of different uh, words in the book of Revelation that represent either Rome or the Roman Empire. So things like when he's referencing Babylon, Babylon in in the book of Revelation is Rome. It's the Roman Empire. And he uses Babylon as a way to remind Jews, uh, hey, remember when we were in the Babylonian exile? Remember when we got cast off? We We don't want that anymore. And so Babylon is referencing Rome. The beast or the beasts represent the empires that they're surrounded by. So the, the book is written to initially the seven churches, right? And they're, they're identified early on in chapters two and three. And those seven churches are surrounded by a bunch of these uh, nations, but they're all a part of the Roman Empire. So another uh, phraseology is is the whore, the whore of Babylon. And um, language like prostitute or whore was often used in the New Testament, but certainly in the book of Revelation, to represent sort of those foreign deities because most of them were fertility religions. And so an easy way to say they're the whore of Babylon or they're the prostitute of Jerusalem is to say you um, you are living out the unfaithful parts of other religions. That's why they would use that language. Uh, Sodom is another uh, 
reference back to the Old Testament where if he's referencing Sodom, it's usually Jerusalem, sort of the heart of where the Roman Empire, for the Jews at least, and the early Christians, um, found their their strength, right? Then you get in chapter 12, and chapter 12 has a, a fascinating story that utilizes a woman um, and um, a child and a dragon. I was so confused by that. I thought that maybe they were trying to tell the story of Jesus, yeah, but in a code like, language. It, but then I was like, I don't think, I don't understand the dragon and, and I don't know. I thought maybe Herod, but then I was like, I need to go to Bible school. Yeah, I have yeah, no idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, the woman, obviously you could say is Mary, but it really represents Israel, just Israel as a nation. The child does represent Jesus because he is coming out of Israel and he's going to save Israel. The dragon just represents evil or, or Satan or the devil um, because there's a clear belief that Satan is represented by either the Roman Empire or by evil itself, just evil outside of the empire, right? So, yeah. There's all kinds. I mean, there's much, much more. We, we, we can't use it all. Yeah, this is really helpful. I wish that it's weird because I needed to prepare for this podcast episode, but I'm also like, now I want to go back and reread it <laughs> <laughs> now that I know some things. Because sure, yeah. honestly, I was just so ridiculously confused. I get it. I get it. Um, okay. So... I kind of shared with you how I've seen Reve Revelation be misused and misconstrued. What are some of the things that you've seen that you want to call out? Let's do some of the myth busting stuff. Yeah. So again, one of them uh, that we've already sort of talked about is that this is designed to tell us when or how the end of the earth is coming, right? That wasn't John's intention at all. And how we got there, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I, I didn't. Well, of course, I only read half of it, and then I switched to the Cliff's Notes. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I didn't see anything about a, quote, rapture. Well, so first of all, the word rapture doesn't exist in Scripture. Nowhere in Scripture does mm. the word rapture exist. Number two, the concept of the rapture, that is to say, uh, uh, when Jesus comes back, some people are going to be left and some people are going to be pulled up, right? That's not in Revelation either. It is in um, Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, and it's a very it's a couple of sentences, and um, it it actually is almost the opposite of what you normally think of. But it's not described nor identified as what is called the rapture. So that's a, a humanly created concept that's not even talked about in the book of Revelation. Likewise, this sense of the end of the world, John is writing this not at all about the end of the world, but rather the end of the current world circumstances. And when I say world, I mean the world they're existing in, not the whole world, just the world they're existing in. But we can use it today to represent, golly, when you are being persecuted or when you are struggling with your faith or where there is an outside sort of influence that's uh, keeping you from living most fully into your faith, these are some uh, tidbits of wisdom about how you can persevere, how you can keep going. That's his point. So, um, and then the other is trying to use all that, because man, right, there is all this imagery, all this data, all this numerology, all these things that it's relatively easy to start going, okay, well, that means this, and this means that, and, and this could apply to that. And I have a couple of friends for whom that's a big deal for them, yeah. right? And I just say, um, man, if that works for you, great. I mean, you know, it's not the way I read it, but I would say we do learn from some of those things, like those images that I just described, and certainly some of those numbers. We know evil exists, right? We know that the Trinity exists. We know that God, in our description and definition, is perfect or whole or complete. And so um, you can use it for those things. But to try to pinpoint... Um, the, using the book of Revelation to say this is when the world's going to come to an end and these are the things that are making it happen, whether that's climate change or a specific leader or a specific set of circumstances. I, I think I've shared this story with you before, but I had a church member in a previous church who was just all about that. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, Daniel, I've done all the study. I've got it all figured out. I know when the end of the world's coming. And this is a church that I was serving uh, in the year 1999. And... Um, uh, he told me just weeks before, December 31st, 1999, that's the date. That's when the earth's coming to an end. This is when the world's going to be destroyed. Y2K. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. And he said, you know, and I, I, I did everything I could not to laugh, right? Because yeah. I'm thinking uh, you, you didn't need the Bible to kind of pinpoint that kind of a date, right? Anybody could pick that particular date. Um, 
but he was sold. He was convinced. Very first Sunday in January of the year 2000, he shows up to church, which is, you know, a couple of days after the end of the world. And he literally sort of had, in his cold day, he literally has a hat. He's got a hat in hand coming to me. And he is downtrodden, his face is down. And he literally just says to me, I am so sorry. I thought I had it figured out. I thought I had all this stuff worked out. And clearly, I didn't have it worked out. I am so sorry. And I just, I just said, Bob, it's all right. I mean, you know, I... I, I wasn't there with you, so I'm, I'm not disappointed. Uh, I wasn't worried. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I felt so bad for him because, yeah. I mean, he was sold. He, he was fully convinced. And, and for him to show up, you can imagine, right? He believes. Yeah. And when it Well, and, and, and I respect that he tried to figure it out on his own because one of the things that really struck me as I was reading this is how easy it would be for someone to use this text to manipulate others. Absolutely. And because there is so much unknown, if someone comes in, because of what my experience is, a lot of people who come to the church are in a really low place and they're just seeking answers. Please, yeah. someone just give me the answers. Yeah. And they don't want the church to say, we don't have all the answers, right. which is actually the truth. We don't have all of the answers. And so they are drawn to churches who have people who claim, yeah, I yeah. know, I understand. I know exactly what this means. And I'm going to tell you what this means for your life right. so that you can have some certainty. Right. And there is just so much ripe content in here to take that to use, uh, right. to, to mold people's minds the right. way you want it to be. And, and I, I think we can all own that within certain realms of all of our lives, we want those simple answers, don't we? Yeah. And, um, and it's a sad part of our state that, that that's what some people will use this for is to captivate them. Yeah. Mm. So again, I only read halfway through. <laughs> Does it mention the Antichrist at all? Like, what's the deal with the Antichrist? I know the mark of the beast is actually in there. <clears throat> yeah, it's funny, too, because much like rapture, the word Antichrist is in Scripture, but it's not in the book of Revelation. It's in the, John's letters, in John 1 and 2 and 3. And the Antichrist is quite literally just what you might assume that it is. It's anyone who is anti Christ. It's anyone who is against his teachings, anyone who re, re, sort of misrepresents who he is or wants him not to be the victor, right? Mm. That's who the Antichrist is. It's not necessarily a specific individual. Mm. So this is just one of my personal opinions, uh, which I love to throw out so often. Of course you do. So why is the language so war-driven and battle-like? It's violent. Yeah. It's aggressive. And to me, it feels incompatible with Christ. Yeah. And yet this is supposed to be news of the comfort and peace in Christ. And, and you claim that Revelation is actually a book of hope. Yeah. How is that possible? Well, so um, obviously everybody can express their faith differently, right? And some, you may hear this language sometimes of what's known as spiritual warfare, right? And spiritual warfare is this sense in which the spiritual realm is at war with the humanly realm. And that's what John's describing. He's describing a spiritual war. And so he's going to use warlike language because it was, excuse me, actually quite common in the day, right? We're in a pretty violent empire, the Roman empire. And therefore it's very easy to talk in that language because it's what I grew up with. It's what I know, whether inside of faith or outside of faith, when I'm in a, an environment where that's the common language, then that's what I'm going to use. And, um, he uses it well because that's also a part of apocalyptic literature, apocalyptic literature, uh, one of the characteristics is, is that there's like this cosmic battle that's going on between good and evil. And I hope you would agree, it's hard to describe a cosmic battle without using battle language. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he's doing. And that's what you would find in the book of Daniel. That's what you'll find in Ezekiel. You'll even find that in those three chapters in the three gospels is sort of battle-like language because uh, evil is fighting good and good is trying to fight back. And uh, the, the sort of end times that are referenced are not the end of the world as we know it, but rather the end of the period or the eon that we're in. This eon that we're in is bad, man. We're getting killed and the stuff is bad. And so we want that to come to an end. That's why you hear that language. We want this stuff to come to an end. Well, it means I want all this oppression to come to an end. I want all this bad stuff to stop. 
But that's where that language comes from. So talking about the relevancy of this book for today, because biblical relevance is one of our core values here. It also strikes me that across a lot of the world, we are now the oppressors. Mm. We are the people, the Christian church. You said, you know, after the fourth century, we became the people in power. We are now the ones, you know, setting the culture for the entirety of the world. So how does revelation apply to us today when we're no longer being persecuted uh, on a cultural level? Maybe individual people feel like they're being persecuted, but I would argue that revelation reinforces a false persecution complex mm -hmm. <laughs> in a lot of mm -hmm. people. Um, so now that we are in power, what does revelation mean for us today? Yeah, uh, that's a very genuine question. I think, um, uh, first of all, those of us in America as Christians are not persecuted, right? Um, people who are killed for their faith in other countries, most specifically Christianity, whether in China or Russia or, or perhaps other countries, they're being persecuted for their faith. Um, do we have struggles with our faith as it relates to, to the culture sometimes? Absolutely. And I think that's where we might find some of that common bond and why it might be relevant today, where um, in the, uh, I mean, I am ashamed to say it, that in a country that says and claims that it's a Christian nation, some of the common things that are going on in society are, you know, vitriol and spitefulness and mean-spiritedness and hatefulness and name-calling and, and actual killing people because they look different, act different, are different, right? And, and so a part of what uh, Revelation can be relevant for us is, so as Christians, we say we're about love and we're about forgiveness and we're about mercy and we're about doing the just thing. And our society really isn't about that. So a part of what we learn from uh, Revelation is, golly, when we're, when we're pushing up against something that's really different and we know that it's a struggle, that struggle becomes like the oppression or like the persecution. What can I do to help um, reinstitute forgiveness and mercy and justice? What can I do to help people become more kind-hearted and, and uh, joy-filled, if you will? That's what it gives to us is in the midst of a culture that is really um, not conducive to the true nature of Jesus, even though some of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ are living that mean spiritedness, right? Um, how can we hang together and, and persevere? Mm. That's how it could be relevant. So last thing, closing thoughts. Do you have any advice for someone who has listened to this episode and said, okay, I'm either going to read Revelation for the first time or I'm going to give it a second chance mm. because maybe they reacted the way I did the first time. I was like, no, 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 <laughs> close it. Um, how would you give them advice for reading this book so that we can see it as a book of hope and, and rise above all of the little details that maybe we don't understand. How can you prep us to better read this book? Well, I hope this will prep you. I don't know that it will, but so a couple of things is one is, um, just know going in, it's hard to read, just know that. And so sometimes in with forethought, I, it helps me to persevere, right? I know it's going to be hard. I know I'm not going to understand everything. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, and I am not one of these people, but I know there's plenty of them out there. If you love, um, uh, science fiction and this read this like science fiction, cause that's what it feels like, right? It feels like, holy crud. What is, I mean, what are all these things and what is, what are these battles and who are these people and why is there so much evil? Think of it as like a science fiction novel and read it as such. Uh, the third thing is, uh, just literally persevere. Uh, when you get to chapters 19, 20, 21, and 22, the last four chapters. I didn't that, make it. That's where the hope is. <laughs> oh no, the, the I hope, missed it. The hope is all at the very end. And I, I won't blow it totally, but I'm going to kind of, um, you know, um, kind of let the cat out of the bag. Um, man, Revelation literally wraps up what was started in the, in the uh, Garden of Eden. 
In the Garden of Eden, remember Adam and Eve eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of the difference between good and evil. And because they've eaten from that fruit, they're also banned from another tree that gets very little mention, but it's called the tree of life. It's at the very end of chapter 3. And they get banned from that, which in turn, of course, bans all of us. We don't get to live eternally anymore because of this sin. Well, the book of Revelation gives us the tree of, uh, the tree of life back. And that tree is for the healing of the nations. And that tree is for helping us to find that eternal connection with the God who wanted it from the very beginning. And John is telling us, if you can persevere, if you can hold on to your faith, if you can survive this trouble, good, John says, and I believe, always conquers evil. Good will always win out, much like Genesis tells us that light always overcomes the darkness. And so there's a lot of darkness in those first 18 chapters, right? That's why it was hard to get through. But once you get to chapter uh, 20 and 21 and 22 in particular, man, there's like a big celebration. There's a big party. All the world comes together again, and the tree of life is accessible again. And so I find it fascinating that um, um, this last book of the Bible sort of fulfills what the intended dream was of God for the garden, for us to have healing and wholeness and connection, relationship and vulnerability and all of those good things. John tells us it's still there and we can see it again. That's hope. Well, there you have it. All right. Well, that's it. I hope y'all crack open Revelation this week or over the next month. It makes fabulous Thanksgiving and Christmas reading. <laughs> so, uh, and thanks for joining us on another episode of Life Plus God. Special thank you for Daniel for doing his research. I know the questions were very scary. Uh, and you answered them all most of them. Right? Mostly satisfactorily. <laughs> I might go and do a little extra research, but uh, I appreciate it. So thanks for joining us. And uh, everybody listening, if you like it, share it. If you appreciate what you're hearing, leave us a review. Right. Uh, let other people know about this Life Plus God podcast thing, because uh, we're really excited by it. And we will see you next time. Take care, y'all. <laughs>